Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Royalty Now, where we bring you face to face with figures from the past and talk about their history. Today's subject is one of the most controversial kings in English history. He's been written about and vilified for centuries for usurping the crown from his nephews and imprisoning them in the Tower of London until they were simply never seen again. But was Richard III truly this evil, hunchbacked creature that he'd been portrayed as in history? Or is this all propaganda written by his enemies? Today, we'll talk about Richard III, what could have happened to the princes in the tower, and then reveal their recreations at the end. Part one of this series includes the full history of the Wars of the Roses, so click the link in the description to watch that for more background. So let's go ahead and get started. Richard was born on October 2nd, 1452, to his mother, Cecily Neville, and his father, the third Duke of York. Although we don't know many specifics about Richard during his youth, we know that his childhood occurred at the same time that tensions in England were rising dramatically. England had lost in the Hundred Years' War, and many people blamed the king, Henry VI, for this massive failure. Many had begun to look elsewhere for a new king. Richard was born into the noble house of York, and his father had the best claim to the throne besides the king himself, and he was keen to take it. Those who supported the Duke of York became known as the Yorkists, and those who were loyal to the crown were called Lancastrians. These two factions would begin a series of civil wars called the Wars of the Roses that would last young Richard's entire life. When Richard was eight, his father captured King Henry VI and forced the king to name him the heir to the English throne. Richard's father would become king when Henry VI passed away. Unfortunately, he wouldn't live to be crowned. Only a few months later, Richard's father and brother were killed by the Lancastrian queen, Margaret of Anjou, in a brutal fashion. The crown and the power it promised now belonged to Richard's eldest brother, Edward, who would finish what his father had started. Edward IV would defeat the Lancastrians at the epic Battle of Towton and be crowned King of England on March 4th, 1461, solidifying the York line on the throne. Unfortunately for Edward IV, his reign would be marred by betrayals from within. In 1468, the Earl of Warwick, who was instrumental in securing the throne for Edward and had raised Richard since he was a boy, would betray them and side with the remnants of the Lancastrian faction. To make things worse, Warwick had convinced Richard's only other brother, George, to betray them by promising George the throne once Edward was deposed. When Warwick and George attacked London, Edward was forced to flee with Richard, who had become the only person he could trust. Richard was incredibly loyal to his older brother and had spent his entire youth training, hoping to become a great soldier. Unfortunately for Richard, during his teens, he had developed a condition called scoliosis, which created a curvature in his spine and gave him uneven shoulders. But this could not stop him from going to war with his brother. I think it's clear that a lot of lives and stories during this time would have turned out completely differently today. And part of that is our knowledge and openness about mental health. Today's sponsor, BetterHelp, can help connect you with a therapist who will listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. I've seen a therapist for years, and it's gotten me through some of the toughest times in my life, including how to deal with rumination and daily anxieties. Take advantage of the fact that you live today and not 500 years ago. It's okay to talk to someone if you're struggling. These days, you don't even have to commute to a therapist's office. You can have your therapy as a video call, a phone call, or even just messaging back and forth at a time that's convenient for your schedule. To get started, just fill out a quick questionnaire to figure out what you're needing, and you'll be matched with a therapist from a network of over 30,000. Starting therapy can be hard, but BetterHelp could be a really comfortable way to get started. Join 4 million people living a happier, healthier life with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description below or visit betterhelp.com royalty now. This link will give you 10% off your first month of therapy with BetterHelp and get you connected with a therapist who will listen and help. When Edward was finally able to gather a large enough army to retake his throne in 1471, 
Richard rode proudly into battle at his brother's side. At the Battle of Barnett, the two would decisively defeat the Earl of Warwick's forces, killing him in the process. It was the first time Richard had ever seen battle, and King Edward was impressed. The rest of the Lancastrian forces were defeated within a month. Before the final battle, their brother George had pleaded for forgiveness for his betrayal, which Edward would graciously give him. But Richard, on the other hand, did not. For his fierce loyalty to Edward before and during the revolt, Richard became Edward's right-hand man. He would give him command of his armies, arrange his marriage to a wealthy bride, and reward him with land and riches from the north of England. But all this favor Richard was receiving made George very jealous. And as the years went on, George began to act out, speaking ill of his brothers, and began surrounding himself with men that were pro-Lancastrian. In 1477, news reached King Edward that George had begun to spread rumors about his marriage, stating that it was illegitimate, meaning that his children were not the rightful heirs to the throne. It was an incredibly dangerous rumor, and a very convenient one for George, since he would be the next in line. Edward would arrest his traitorous brother and lock him up at the Tower of London. Yet still for eight long months, he could not decide what to do with him. It wasn't until his wife, Elizabeth Woodville, begged that George be made an example of that Edward finally decided George's punishment. On the 25th of February, 1478, George was privately executed for his crimes against the king. No doubt a pivotal emotional moment for Richard. Although Richard had no part in what happened to George, news would spread that it was Elizabeth that had spurred Edward to order his execution. That news may have planted a seed in Richard's head that would change the course of history. Richard would spend the rest of the 1470s and early 1480s commanding armies for Edward's England, growing into a well-respected and wealthy man. Meanwhile, Edward would spend the rest of his reign drinking and partying, spending extravagantly on expensive status symbols, fine jewelry, and clothing. By 1483, Edward's health was rapidly failing, and by April of that year, it was clear that he wasn't going to get better. Still, he was strong enough to add to his will that Richard would become Lord Protector after his death, until his 12-year-old son grew into maturity. On April 9, 1483, King Edward IV died, and a notorious chain of events began. The news didn't reach Richard for nearly a week, but when it did, he immediately left for London to pledge his loyalty to the new king. It would take nearly two weeks for Richard to make the journey down, so in the meantime, he sent a letter to London asking to be confirmed as Lord Protector immediately. He encountered hostility right away. It was the Woodvilles that orchestrated the King's Council to deny him. The Woodvilles had benefited tremendously from King Edward's rule, rising from second-class nobility to royalty, and they knew that Richard wouldn't favor them as much as Edward did. When Richard was told of this denial, he quickly realized that the Woodvilles were making a play for power, and he had to begin spinning a plan of his own. On April 29th, the new king, young Edward V, escorted by his uncle, Anthony Woodville, met with Richard at the town of Stony Stratford. Richard acted cordially, spending the whole day drinking with Anthony and went to bed as if nothing was wrong. But the following morning, Richard would have Edward V's uncles and bodyguards arrested and imprisoned for treason. When Edward V came out confused, Richard told him that his uncle, Anthony Woodville, had been plotting against him and trying to deny Richard the role of Lord Protector. He was now there to escort the king and take him to London personally. The two were blood-related, but technically were nothing but strangers to each other. Edward V had been raised far away from where Richard was living. Edward deeply trusted his uncle Anthony Woodville and was extremely suspicious of his arrest. But Richard insisted on taking him, and with no other real option, Edward V would have to go to London under Richard's protection. When the news reached London that Anthony Woodville had been arrested and her son taken by Richard, 
Elizabeth Woodville fled to sanctuary. She would be safe in Westminster Abbey with her five daughters and her youngest son, Richard of Shrewsbury. When Richard arrived in London, he would take Edward V and lodge him in the royal apartments at the Tower. This technically was nothing unusual. The Tower of London was exactly where kings customarily awaited their coronations. What was unusual was that Richard declared that he would be postponing Edward's coronation from May 4th to the 22nd of June. In the coming days, Richard would go on to get the council to name him Lord Protector. But the council added the caveat that his powers would expire the day of Edward V's coronation, an obvious sign that the council was already suspicious of Richard's intentions. With his new power as Lord Protector, Richard demanded that Richard of Shrewsbury, Elizabeth Woodville's youngest child and the only other boy, be released into his protection so that he could play an important role in his brother's coronation. But the council, who were already growing wary of Richard, saw no reason why the boy should be taken from his mother in sanctuary. They denied Richard's demands. With the Woodvilles against him and the members of the council suspecting him of a power grab, Richard felt he was being dangerously backed into a corner. This was becoming a game of survival, and each day that passed, he grew closer to losing everything. On June 13th, Richard snapped. In the middle of a council meeting, Richard accused Lord Hastings, an ally of his, of treason, and immediately arrested him Within minutes, Lord Hastings was taken into the courtyard and executed without a trial. If he did this to an ally of his, what would he do to an enemy? If Richard couldn't get anything done through diplomacy, he would do it through fear. Three days later, the Archbishop of Canterbury went to see Elizabeth Woodville, and he reassured her that Richard was doing nothing wrong. Everything was perfectly fine. With his reassurance, Elizabeth reluctantly handed over Richard of Shrewsbury to the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was also taken to the Tower of London, joining his brother Edward. With the boys secured in the Tower, Richard was now past the point of no return. If Edward V ever became king, Richard would surely be killed for treason. In a decision that shocked the council, Richard postponed Edward's coronation indefinitely. He began to sow propaganda in his favor. Sermons began to preach that Richard was the only legitimate heir to the House of York, stating that Edward IV and Elizabeth's marriage was illegitimate because Edward IV had been previously promised to marry another. Young Edward V and Richard of Shrewsbury were declared to be bastards. Not long after, a group of lords, knights, and gentlemen petitioned for Richard to become the King of England. And on July 6th, 1483, Richard was crowned King Richard III of England, snatching the crown from his nephew's head. The boys were never seen outside the tower again. It wasn't until the 1930s, 451 years after they disappeared, that we get any glimpse into what happened in the tower at all. The records of an Italian monk named Dominic Mancini, who visited England from 1482 to 1483, were rediscovered, and as it turns out, he had witnessed the events of Richard's betrayal firsthand. In an excerpt written about Edward V and his brother Richard, it states what happened to them leading up to Edward's coronation. He and his brother were withdrawn into the inner apartments of the tower proper, and day by day began to be seen more rarely behind the bars and windows, till at length they ceased to appear altogether. The physician John Argentine, the last of his attendants whose services the king enjoyed, reported that the young king, like a victim prepared for sacrifice, sought remission of his sins by daily confession because he believed that death was facing him. I have seen many men burst into tears and lamentations when mention was made of Edward after his removal from men's sight, and already there is a suspicion that he had been done away with. Even Mancini, who would end up leaving before Richard's coronation, 
had no idea what happened to the boys. Yet there is one other mention that has really interested historians. In July of 1484, Richard added a regulation to his household. It said, Item, my lord of Lincoln and my lord Morley be at one breakfast, the children together at another breakfast. What makes this so interesting is that by July 1484, Richard's only son and heir had already passed away. So what children is he talking about? Could it be that the boys were taken away and raised in secret, far away from London, and that Richard had not murdered them after all? The fate of the two boys has remained a mystery all this time. However, most people in 15th century England agreed that Richard was responsible for their deaths and he became incredibly unpopular. Almost immediately after his coronation, a rebellion grew against Richard. And by that October, he was forced to crush the revolt of his once right-hand man, Henry Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham. The Woodvilles had been stripped of their influence and they were steeped in revenge for the presumed murder of their sons. They were looking everywhere to find someone with a claim to the English throne they found it in a man named Henry Tudor. In an attempt to strengthen his claim, Henry Tudor swore an oath to marry Edward IV's eldest daughter, Elizabeth of York, uniting the houses of York and Lancaster in a strange twist of fate. Soon, even the French were supporting Henry Tudor, and on August 1st, 1485, Henry had landed in Wales with 6,000 men ready for war. But in reality, Henry Tudor wasn't a man of war. Although he was strong and decisive, he was also slender and inexperienced. Richard III had grown up in battle, impressing his brother so much that he would later become his most trusted soldier. Mancini described Richard's war prowess in another passage. Whenever a difficult and dangerous policy had to be undertaken, it would be entrusted to his discretion and his generalship. Richard had never lost a battle, and he wasn't planning on doing it now. Richard and his army rode confidently to meet Henry and his forces. On August 22, 1485, the two would meet at the Battle of Bosworth. Richard's army clearly outnumbered Henry's. When the battle began, Richard's vanguard attacked, but began to get pushed back. When Richard signaled his troops to attack, one of his commanders, William Stanley, took no action at all. Just then, Richard III caught a glimpse of Henry Tudor across the battlefield, and he immediately ordered a cavalry charge aimed directly at him. He was hoping to personally kill Henry and end the battle quickly. Richard crashed into Henry's forces, unhorsing knights and killing Henry's standard bearer. Richard raised his sword to kill Henry Tudor, ending this revolt and solidifying his claim as king. All the things he had done would be worth it in the end. But what Richard did not realize is that his commander, William Stanley, had chosen to betray him. Only a sword's length away from Henry, Richard was surrounded by his own men, famously yelling out one word to the men before they closed in on him. Treason. Richard was dragged from his horse and down into a melee. It would take 10 wounds and the loss of his helmet, but King Richard III fell at the Battle of Bosworth. Even Henry Tudor's official historian recorded that King Richard alone was killed fighting manfully in the thickest press of his enemies. Richard III would be the last English king to die on the battlefield. Henry Tudor would become King Henry VII and would unite the White Rose of York with the Red Rose of the Lancasters, with his marriage to Elizabeth of York, ending the Wars of the Roses once and for all. The Tudor dynasty would go on to become one of the most famous in history, with King Henry VIII and Elizabeth I reigning over England under the House of Tudor. But the mystery of the princes in the tower is still unsolved. It's hard to ignore that Richard III is simply the most likely culprit. Sir James Tyrrell, a loyal servant of Richard's, 
was actually said to have confessed to the murder of the princes before his death in 1502. However, a contemporary Portuguese document suggests that Henry Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham, was responsible for their deaths and that they died in his custody. Some historians even suggest James Tyrrell and Henry Stafford took it upon themselves together to kill the princes, not waiting for Richard's order. Of course, it's possible that the boys simply died of illness in the tower. We have the record of the doctor's visit close to when they disappeared, but then why keep it such a secret? And of course, there is the famous theory that one or both of the boys escaped and were raised elsewhere. The most famous case is of Perkin Warbeck, who actually garnered considerable support by claiming to be Richard of Shrewsbury before being executed by Henry VII. In 1674, two human skeletons were found under a staircase at the Tower of London. When the bones were examined in 1933, they concluded that they belonged to children that would have been around the ages of 12 and 9. Queen Elizabeth II had previously refused to DNA test the remains due to objections from the Church of England. However, King Charles has indicated that he would back a DNA investigation, so we may have more information coming on the princes soon. So what do you think? Did they escape? Were they hidden away from the world? Or did Richard III really order the deaths of his own nephews to take the crown for himself? So, what did Richard III and the princes in the tower really look like? I wanted to make a recreation of Richard, who we have much more information on, but I also wanted to give the boys a face, even though source material for their appearances is next to none. So let's start with Richard. There are no portraits of Richard surviving today that were made in his own lifetime. But unlike the princes, researchers have located the lost body of Richard III which allows us to get a glimpse of the real man that we just don't get with other monarchs. Philippa Langley is the founder of the Richard III Society and the main driving force behind the amazing discovery of Richard's body under a parking lot in Leicester in 2012. This allowed researchers to learn more about Richard's true appearance and settle some long-held disputes. Through genetic analysis, the University of Leicester team determined that he had a 96% chance of having blue eyes and a 77% chance of having blonde hair, at least in his childhood. This allowed them to tell which portrait of Richard was the most accurate, and it seems to be this earliest version found. This arched portrait made about 30 to 40 years after his death shows Richard with light eyes and medium brown hair. Before the discovery of his body, part of Richard's legacy had been that he was an evil hunchback with a withered arm. This was mostly spread by Thomas More, who was only eight years old when Richard died. Thomas More worked for the Tudors, so he was a pretty biased source who had a vested interest in making the Tudor line look more secure. Now the researchers found that Richard did have pretty severe scoliosis. In real life, this would cause a slight asymmetry, with the left shoulder being held higher than the right. And you can see that a little bit in this portrait. Contemporary accounts from Richard's reign do mention a slight shoulder abnormality, which makes sense, but nothing so severe that would make him an obvious hunchback with a withered arm or any of these rumors that were spread after his death. The researchers also found that his bones were quite delicate, which matches up with contemporary accounts that he was rather a small man who was surprisingly good in battle despite appearing feminine, in their words. On the skeleton, there are eight minor wounds from various weapons, and two fatal blows at the base of the skull, which aligns with the accounts that he died in the middle of a group of attackers. Craniofacial expert Caroline Wilkinson worked on a 3D model of Richard III, which I'll also reference in my recreation. In my depiction, I'm going to try to kind of thread the needle between the most accurate portrait and the forensic reconstruction, since the two do have some differences. Now, let's talk about the princes, and this is of course where it gets more difficult. For a young Edward V, we do have one likeness. This one, from an illuminated manuscript translated by Edward's uncle, Anthony Woodville. 
There's also this stained glass depiction, but it was made after Edward's death in the 1500s. And of course, there are numerous depictions and portraits from centuries much later. So what we do know is this. Edward V was a blonde boy of 12. And that's about it. It's reasonable to guess that his younger brother Richard, who was nine at the time, might look similar to him. I've made a fully artistic depiction of the boys based on the single portrait we have as well as the features of their relatives. I've essentially borrowed some features from each parent. So while Richard III's recreation is fully grounded in reality, the recreations of the boys are just artistic and meant to honor their memory. So let's take a look at Richard III and the princes in the tower now. Thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you for the next video.